Hi everyone, I am super excited this morning, absolutely stoked for this interview. I have Travis Christofferson with me, who is an amazing man with an incredible history of writing absolutely astounding books, uh, books like Curable, like Tripping Over the Truth. Uh, he authored one with, uh, co-authored with Dr. Dom D'Agostino, who I'm also a fan of. Uh, you, you, Travis, welcome to the show, firstly. Um, you're an incredible writer, uh, and the, the research and stuff that you've done is just absolutely mind-blowing, so we're going to dig into that today. So welcome to the show, Travis. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Lisa. I appreciate it. Thank you for the kind words. Oh, I really, really mean them. Like it's it's your work and, and the work say of Dr. Dom, who's also been on here, and uh, had Dr. Charles Meakin on, and Maggie and Bradley Jones from the Cancer Revolution, and yeah, all of these amazing people have really contributed. I feel to my personal life story with my mum, and uh, as my listeners know, we've been dealing with uh, lymphoma. And, uh, you know, touch wood right now, we're, we're looking very good. There's no cancer to be found anywhere. And I'm just desperate to get this information out there because what I'm realizing so much now and that I've been in this sort of space for the last eight, nine months is that uh, most people still have no idea of uh, that the somatic mutation theory is not what they think it is they don't know anything about the metabolic approach to cancer uh they don't know about any off-label drug combinations just so many things they don't know so that's what we want to dig into today so Great. yeah so travis can you give us a little bit of a background on yourself before we dig into your amazing research yeah yeah my so my background is very non-linear i i started off my undergraduate degree was in biochemistry and then life sort of interceded, and I, I actually jumped into the family business, got married, had two children, but I always wanted to go back. And so I went back to finish my master's degree, which I had started, but I only had three credits to finish. And they were kind enough to let me do an independent studies class. So I did it on cancer metabolism. They let me choose the topic. And I just happened to be leafing through my Kindle and I ran into this book called Cancer is a Metabolic Disease by Tom Seyfried. Yep. Yeah, you're nodding your head. I'm sure you're yeah, aware yeah. of it. Yeah. It's a foundation for a lot of what you're talking about. And it just blew me away. I, I, you know, I had learned cancer from a standard textbook that it was extremely dogmatic theory that the cancer was cancer was caused by somatic mutations. That's a somatic mutation theory that there's a series of sequential mutations that sort of rewire the cellular circuitry towards uncontrolled growth. And that was what cancer was. And this book was this textbook sort of book that walked through over 100 years of evidence showing that proposing a new theory, I guess is the way to say it, that cancer was precipitated by metabolism rather than genetic mutations. And the, the amount of evidence to me was just astonishing yeah. and good evidence from credible labs. And so I did my thesis on that, and that inspired me to look at, because it was such a beautiful story, and I, I like, I've always enjoyed writing. I just read The Emperor of All Maladies, which is literally a biography of cancer, which marches through all the history, but never looks at cancer from any other lens other than this dogmatic viewpoint of the somatic mutation theory. And so that the metabolic theory of cancer lended itself really well to a book because it's a story of a scientist named Otto Warburg, who in the 20s proposed this theory. Mm -hmm. And he was an absolutely brilliant biochemist. He'd won the Nobel Prize. He was nominated for three Nobels and three separate achievements. Wow. Um, he was regarded as probably the, the premier biochemist of the 20th century. But then he proposed this cancer theory. And by the time he died in 1970, it was really sort of ridiculed as a simplistic yeah. model of cancer. Mm -hmm. And so then the, you know, the years go on and the somatic mutation theory is locked down. We enter this era of targeted therapy, which was extraordinarily underwhelming. The Cancer Genome Atlas Project kicked off, which was to be the Manhattan Project of Cancer and really find those series of mutations that were causative for each type of cancer. And it didn't come anywhere near that. It really just created this wake of confusion. And so there was this rekindling of Warburg's original theory. And it's still going on. It's still, it's still this disease that is so incredibly complex that th you, nobody can say with confidence that we absolutely know what it is. But what we do know is these new theories have a ton of data, a ton of credibility, and are sort of emerging now and, and you know, getting, getting the attention they deserve, I guess. 
Yeah, and this is the thing, like War- Warburg's, this was 1924 or something that he did the original discovery, and it was the sort of direction we were going until the whole genetic side of things came into play, I think in the 50s and 60s, correct me if I'm wrong. And then from then on, it was like, now that's old hat. We're not going down that route anymore. And this is far more sexy to be studying genetics and stuff. And and so at the basis of all this is that um, people thought that it was a a genetic mutation that causes cancer or a number of genetic mutations and that they'd be able to hone in on this and, and, and find the answer. And literally billions of dollars and decades have gone into this. Now, it's very hard to walk that back to justify that you've gone down this road. And then you come along with people like, you know, Richard Beach and, and Thomas Seyfried who go, hang on a minute, uh, what Otto Warburg was talking about is still very interesting and start to go into that whole metabolic side of cancer. And uh, the, the, the opposition is just huge. I mean, getting this information out because we've, we're up against, I mean, you've written a book called Curable as well about the state of the whole health system in New Zealand, it's no different than in America, really. Um, it's a disaster, isn't it? Why, why do we not always follow the actual science? <laughs> if it was just about the actual science, we'd be so much further ahead than what we are. Right, right. Yeah, you get into this, this institutional inertia from these massive systems, right? And, and yeah, Curable was really sparked by looking at this chart that showed the life expectancy of people in, I think it was 15 developed countries versus their per capita healthcare expenditure. In the United States, we spend far more than anybody else per person on healthcare, but have the lowest life expectancy. Wow. And so how can that be? Clearly, we're doing something very wrong. The healthcare system is entirely inefficient, if that's the case. And so it's just, that was the 30,000 foot view. And what are we doing wrong? And when you really look deep, um, the two problems really are variation in treatment over treatment and the drug development process, I think is one of the, the main problems too. When you, when you look at drugs are developed for a very small indication um, for a disease once it's manifested, right? And you don't want to get to that point. You should, when you consider your lifetime, you can think of it as a tree. So you sort of age up the trunk. And then as you get older, chronic diseases start to branch off. And so you want to get down to this trunk and what are the fundamental processes that are going on that lead to these diseases? And we don't focus on that. We're terrible at focusing on prevention. We focus on the disease, trying to treat it once it's already manifest, which is an absolutely horrible strategy. And so I think that's the, you know, the third bucket is we just don't try to prevent disease as well as we should. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's what I'm all about is try to get into that space before we get to that point. And even like convincing your local GPs to do a blood test every few months so that you can see how you're doing. It's like driving a car without a dashboard, in my opinion, when we can't have these tests. And these tests are cheap and available and would save us millions of dollars (laughs) if we could just get them done early, you know, so that we can prevent things from happening or we get the early signs of things happening. And and, and this is why I love doing this podcast because I want to to help people to be in that preventative space because it's bloody awful having experienced it in my own family for the last six, seven years because Prior to cancer, we had an aneurysm journey with mum that she wasn't meant to survive either. Um, And realising there was nothing there. And if I'd done a little bit of prevention, maybe it wouldn't have happened, you know. And you can't prevent everything because we don't know everything. But there's a lot I could have done. And to be in that space now to help other people stop, but, you know, going down that path is, is, or at least delaying, you know. And we have the technology now to really be living a long time. The aging code has been cracked by people like David Sinclair and many, many others. Uh, You know, we we are starting to work this stuff out. But at the same time, we're dying earlier now. Like, you know, we're, we're, and we're living disease. The last 20, 30 years of a person's life is often full of disability, disease, pain, and suffering. And yes, we're keeping them medically alive with all the great drugs and things that we have. But the quality of life is very poor often, and, and nobody wants that. So incurable, like what, what, what do you think we can do to change the system? This is the, the $60 million question here. Yeah. You know, how do you, you change ch- institutions? You have to change. I think you have to change incentive structures. You know, in the U.S., we, we have a fee for a largely a fee for service system. So doctors get paid for every 
you know, drug they prescribe, every yeah. procedure. And so that's why there's this big incentive to overtreat and very little incentive to prevent. But there's ideas like um, one they're doing down south is where they give primary care cl clinics a big bolus of money per patient. And they say, okay, you can keep that money if your patients don't need need procedures and things like that. So wow. now the doctors are completely incentivized to keep their patients healthy. So that's the first thing is you have to incentivize the doctors to be preventative in nature. And then, you know, when you look at the science, like one example is insulin resistance, which leads to diabetes. And we know worldwide diabetes is an epidemic. And, and the way doctors in primary care clinics diagnose it is by a rise in blood sugar. But if you just tested, like you were talking about earlier, that we have these lab tests. If you just tested for fasting insulin regularly, you can see when people are becoming to be, be become insulin resistant decades before blood sugar starts to rise. And this is where you have this perfect window to intervene, but we don't do that. Wow. It's very reversible. It's through lifestyle. And, you know, people become motivated when they see laboratory numbers and you talk to them what this means. And that is a very, one of those, again, back to that trunk of the tree, one of those fundamental core processes that accelerates aging. Okay. It, it, it just completely alters your energy metabolism and your body becomes starved of, of energy, which it needs to repair DNA, to clean up defunct proteins, to do all these housekeeping processes that slowly lead to all chronic disease, neurodegeneration, cardiovascular, cancer. So that, that's just one simple thing, one blood test where we could be extraordinarily proactive. But most doctors, when you write, I want an insulin test, they'll ask why, Yeah, you know, why do you want that? Yeah. So it's just, yeah. we have to change the framework. They have to get different training and on what these are early on. And, I, you know, institutions have incredible inertia to, to change them takes a, 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 we knew smoking killed people, but it took decades before the smoking, they slowly went down, but they, you know, eventually they get there. Exactly. That's a really good analogy because, you know, we were told back in the 50s that it was healthy to smoke. I mean, my, my mum smoked throughout her pregnancy with me. Uh, I developed cancer where there was no um, cancer, sorry, asthma, uh, where there was none in the family history. You know, did that? She was told that it was healthy to do so, you know, by the medical yeah. profession. You know, and this is the thing it does take these long periods of time. And you think, well, that was way back then in the dark ages. They wouldn't do that now. But we're still bumbling along in that sort of a, 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 an approach. And, you know, coming back to the insulin resistance, if there's one thing that I can get people to do is, is, is the easy sort of things like, well, they're not easy, but they're simple lifestyle interventions. And it's not sexy when I'm working with a client and I ask them if they can change their diet, if they can, you know, start cutting back on the on the carbs maybe doing a keto diet uh or going in that direction cutting out the the, the crappy fats in their in their diet um you know these simple things that people can do that bring massive massive but nobody wants to do the hard work and it isn't you know like i love food <laughs> it's yeah. a daily battle we all have that daily battle but if you understand the the just how important this part of the puzzle is not just the food thing but just that's a big piece of it like our our, our standard diet you guys call it the standard american diet it's pretty much the standard diet here in new zealand too uh is just riddled with carbs and poor fats processed foods uh you know pesticides, herbicides, all of the horrible things that go into our food chain, which is a completely another discussion. But there is, is an opportunity to do something. And then you add in, of course, the exercise. And these are two, but they're very, they're very, they're too simple. That people, when they hear, you know, you've got to start exercising a little bit more and cutting back and changing what you're eating and doing some perhaps intermittent fasting or something. Then, but where's the magic pill? You know, I want the magic pill approach because that's where we've been conditioned to. Um, and the, in, with the with the uh, blood sugar and the insulin, that is, the, you know, you can look at a person, mostly in their 40s, who's got a muffin top going on, and you know that stuff's happening in there. You, you know that they're down that pathway of metabolic dysregulation, that they're in the initial stages. And it isn't, you know, it's not just because you age, this is what's aging you. <laughs> We've got it backwards, yeah. you know, like it's not inevitable, you know, like if you've got a, if you can still see your stomach, 
if you can still see your core, your muscles in your core, I always think that's a really good indication. You don't have to have the super six pack, but if you can actually see that you've got musculature there, then you probably haven't got a metabolic dysregulation. That's a completely unscientific way of looking at it, but it's the way I look at it. <laughs> and it's very oh, it's, simple. It's, it's valid, yeah. And it's it's funny to me, you know, you look at the animal kingdom and, and lions, wolves, deer, they, they all look fit, right? And they're living in this biological niche that they've lived in, that they evolved in over, over thousands of years. And humans, you know, we lived in that our niche for, for millions of years, but then all of a sudden the last 10 to 12,000 years, because of agricultural technology, we've all of a sudden been th completely thrown out of it. And, and uh, you know, you would never walk around and eat wheat grain uh, and the savannah, it's just the energy expenditure to do that before combines was, it would make no sense. So we've completely altered our diet in the last 10,000 years. And of course, you know, we don't know better than evolution. We like to think that we, we know better, but our, that's a drastic dietary shift towards a massive amount of processed food and carbohydrates and oils that we never ate, all these foods that we just never encountered. So, if, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it seems pretty obvious there would be consequences. And when you look at the human race, we do look curiously sickly compared to other animals. You know, we just we just do, and and I don't think we're supposed to live this way and and feel this way. The majority of people, and you're right, it's just a combination of probably a terrible diet and just not moving enough because we were designed to go out and have to work every day to catch food. That's what we evolved, and when you uncouple your your physiology from that environmental niche, you see all kinds of problems, and it's very clear. You can study hunter-gatherer societies, more traditional societies, you, you'll never see somebody overweight. You'll never yeah. see insulin resistance. And, and in particular, you'll never see systemic chronic inflammation. Mm. And the majority of people in the you know, Western world as they age, they'll get more and more chronic inflammation. It just, it should go back to baseline after an infection, but it just steps up and stays there. And that's a very new phenomenon for, for our species. And that's another, you know, if there's two root causes of disease, it's insulin resistance and chronic inflammation. inflammation. <laughs> yeah. It's just so, so, so true. And, and, and this is for everything from arthritis to heart disease, to Alzheimer's, to, and this is where yeah. when you understand cellular health a little bit and you understand how you can improve cellular health uh, and get rid of inflammatory markers or, or work towards that, then you, you're getting towards the, the way higher up the, the line you know like all of these diseases if I'm working with the client they say well how can you how can you take a similar approach with someone with cancer or with someone with Alzheimer's because at the top of the apex is the problem of cellular dysregulation and if we can get those cells operating how they should be in each of the organs then we're going to have a good basis and you don't even know need to know the specifics of that particular disease like to the detail that a specialist would know because you understand how to get these inflammatory processes under control or what direction to go in to, to order to do that. And these things become sort of panaceas. Like in the background, I've got a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. I don't know if you noticed that, that thing sitting over the there. Soft side, yep. Yeah, I got one too. You've got one too. Brilliant. Yeah. So it's a mild, mild one. There's obviously better ones and I've had lots of podcasts on hyperbaric oxygen therapy, but that is one of those things that can attack all those inflammation, that inflammation in the body, the inflammatory cytokines and chemokines and all of that sort of stuff on a, on a, so it becomes a, a sort of a panacea hyperbaric. Like there are so many things that people go, I can't possibly help all of that. Well, it can because it's providing oxygen to otherwise hypoxic tissue. It's creating more stem cell production. It's doing attacking the inflammation. And these are all baseline aging processes that we're, we're, we're undergoing. But that's too simple. <laughs> and the hyperbaric yeah. is one of those other things that is like, why isn't this in every person's household, at least, or not in, in every doctor's office? Why? You why know? isn't it studied more, right? It's yeah. so simple and cheap. And why, why aren't there more clinical trials? But it, it's, it's interesting to me, you know, not just the food composition, but the amount, the, the amount that we eat and the, you know, the fact we eat every day, that certainly didn't go on throughout our evolutionary history. And there was times, you know, when we had periodic food scarcity a lot where you just couldn't get calories the winter time, you know, very, whenever. And it's in evolution. It appears that evolution has built in 
a, a pr powerful signal to that when you're in a caloric deficiency, you begin, you switch your metabolism. I'm sure you've talked about this in your podcast to something called ketosis, where you mm. completely shift what you're burning to um, these little small molecules that come from fat. And they're, they're just absolutely fascinating. And it sounds like snake oil. When you, when you look at the data, the clinical trials that have been done, everything from Alzheimer's to Parkinson's to cancer to diabetes, it, it, you know, the data is remarkable. And so that's another way we've completely stepped out of that, something that evolution baked into us that we just don't utilize. There's probably a lot of people in the Western world that never enter the state of ketosis in their life. And we still don't know, you know, should you be in it continuously or periodically? Those are questions that need to be worked out. But it's what, what happens is absolutely remarkable. When you just go for about 16 hours without eating, your immune system completely shifts. All those pro-inflammatory monocytes retreat back into your bone marrow. And, and so they, they, they infiltrate tissues, they leave the tissues, go into the bone marrow. So you enter this state of low inflammation. And then when you eat, when you think about eating, what it is, is it's really a wholesale invasion from the outside world. And your body has no idea what could be in there. There could be pathogenic bacteria. And, you know, there's certainly bacteria, there's virus remnants, there's all kinds of things, different proteins that, that you know, are not typically encountered. So your immune system mobilizes every time you eat. So if you're eating constantly, you're in this constant state of mobilizing the immune system and it never really gets to rest. So that has implications for autoimmunity, for really, you know, every, every chronic inflammatory disease we just talked about. That's just absolutely gold. And of course, you've written the book, uh, the, fourth, uh, the Fourth Fuel Ketones. Um, what yeah. is your take on, on like the keto diet? Um, uh, there's, you know, there's so many different types of keto diets for starters. And there's, you know, the modified Atkins yeah. versus the, you know, the hardcore stuff and the four to one ratio and all of these sort of things. You know, for the average person getting into something like this, where would you start if you're wanting to do a keto diet? I mean, obviously, if you've got someone like mum with cancer, she's on a super strict keto diet. Um, I'm pretty well and healthy. I do have carbs in the mix. Um, and if I'm doing a lot of uh, aerobic activity and sport and things, a little bit more um, and, and cycling in and out of things. But where, where can we start with this whole ketosis? And can you explain a little bit, and I'm still learning. There's so much to learn on, on ketosis and ketones. Um, so where am I going with this question? Yeah, like what when we go into this fasted state and we start producing our own body's ketones, what actually happens in the body? So you've explained that the monocytes retreat back into the into the bone marrow. What else is going on? Because for for the brain, for the heart. Uh, yeah. this is the perfect food as well. So for someone with Alzheimer's listening to this or dementia or anything like that. It's, it's interesting. So when you stop eating carbohydrates or you fast one or the other, and you know, ketosis really is something that happens during the fasted state. When you look at a ketogenic diet, it's really the nutritional maintenance of the fasting state. So it's like a sort of a trick to maintain that, that fasted state. So what happens is you have about 24 to 36 hours of carbohydrates stored up in the form of glycogen in your liver and muscle. So when you stop eating, you burn through that quickly. And now your body has sort of a crisis to face. How does it get fuel? So it will begin to mobilize the fat that you have. And that fat spills out into the bloodstream. It goes into the liver. And it begins this process of beta oxidation where your enzymes cleave off two carbon units and you can burn, burn that fat. But when you, when you have a caloric deficit, it does this process so fast that it spills out these two carbon units. And some of those get converted by enzymes in the, in the cells, cytoplasm into these ketone bodies, acetoacetate and then beta hydroxybutyrate. Those then enter the systemic circulation to take the place of glucose. There, there will, you know, glucose will never go down below a certain level, but it will drop to where you need some sort of replacement, especially for the brain, which is a huge metabolic sink. And it can only burn, burn glucose or ketones. It can't burn fats like most other cells. And the brain costs us about 20% of our energy metabolism. So the ketones will enter the brain and the heart and the muscle and replace glucose. Now, what makes them unique is number one, as a fuel, there is more thermodynamic energy per carbon unit than glucose. So they burn hotter. You mm -hmm. get more 
ATP per carbon unit wow. burn. Yep. So it's, it's a, that's why Dr. Veach called it a super fuel. But beyond that, it, they're, they're doing just an incredible amount of other things. They enter the, the metabolism differently. They don't go down the glyco glycolytic pathway. So they enter the mitochondria and get burned oxidatively right away. And when they do that, they shift the ratio of these coenzyme couples. And coenzyme couples are the like the money in the economy. That's what our body creates and then diffuses out to use for energy, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like money in economy. So it charges the ratio of those coenzyme couples to where there's more energy. Now those do everything. And one of the main things they do is they recharge the antioxidant glutathione. So one thing you can notice when you shift somebody to ketosis is they have a huge antioxidant capacity. And when you do it to mice, you can give them a, a lethal radiation dose to where 70% of the mice die when they're in a carbohydrate metabolism. When they're in the ketosis, none of the mice die. Wow. That, that's it's pretty profound. Blind. Yeah. Radiation is ox, it's just free radicals. It's it's what you know what David Sinclair would say is slowly aging us over time. Mm. So you get this huge, robust way that you can deal with this constant sort of damaging presence in our lives. Yeah. So I'm really interested if, you know, if we can do long-term trials to see if it really does slow down the aging process, but there's all kinds of diseases that are oxidative in nature. When someone's going through chemotherapy, which is an oxidative drug and radiation is pure oxidation. Yep. Yep. When you have somebody fast and this clinical trial has been done before chemo or radiation, the side effects are so far diminished and, and the, not the subjective side effects like fatigue, they are too, but the ones you can count, like the number of times a person throws up goes from yep. six a day to zero, the number of mouth sores, the amount of hair loss. So you get this, you get this protective effect in healthy cells while at the same time, cancer cells don't like ketones. Everyone knows they love sugar. I think most people have heard that statement before, and it's true. They, they absolutely have a voracious appetite for sugar. So they when there's less blood sugar and more ketones, they are oxidatively stressed so that oxidative chemotherapy and radiation effectively kills them easier. So it's this kind of dream therapeutic scenario for, for cancer therapy. And that's where I feel it should be studied is yeah. alongside standard of care to see if you can improve survival and improve people's quality of life during that process. And this is just so like, uh, I know Walter Lango did that, that research, like um, getting yeah. people to fast uh, 48 to 72 hours, I think it was before their chemo uh, and had a hell of a time convincing the oncologist to let them do that because there is you this read fear. the paper. Yeah, that's right. In the, in the paper. Yep. <laughs> yeah. There is this fear like that cancer patients obviously lose weight. Cachexia is a real problem. But that's a really different mechanism. Like what we're trying to do here is a short, sharp uh, hermetic stress, basically, on the body that sends the body into this whole state that you, you've mentioned where it's actually protective and it's an acquiescent state. So when you put the chemo in, which goes after the rapidly proliferating cells, uh, which are the cancer cells, which is great. But it also goes after the stomach lining. It all, and that's why you vomit. It, you know, you, it also goes after your hair follicles because so so the, 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 all of those things are much much less when you have a little bit of a fast before your chemo, um, yeah. and yet when you like I I've, uh, my mum has been on temozolomide. It was one of the chemos, and I and I got a very mild dose, and I didn't go like the full you know, like they want to go maximum tolerable dose. And I was like, no, we want to do smaller dose, you know, did my research, fought hard to get what I wanted, along with immunotherapy, rituximab, um, did, still did genetic testing to see that she would respond to those drugs, by the way, that was quite interesting with the RGCC. Um, but that, then in fasting prior and being in ketosis prior, and she's come through that really, really well as someone, as an 80-year-old, um, and I mean, we actually got on top of the, the cancer was no longer visible in the MRI before we started the chemo, but I put that in the mix as well, because I didn't want, you know, I know how nasty, uh, cancer can be and it can change its metabolism. And I just wanted to make sure that we, you know, keep this stuff gone. Right. And temozolomide yeah. is, is a milder form. It's not like, a, some of the, the heavier, heavier duty ones, but that whole process it, and when I sit in the chemo room with all the other patients and they're given orange juice and sandwiches to eat for their lunch and on the way out of the oncologist's office he says 
oh, Isabel, you've lost a kilo. You better start eating your pudding. And, and I'm like, and therein lies the problem. <laughs> this is what yeah. my hematologists and oncologists are telling us to do. And they just are completely, they, I mean, they know that PET scans, how they diagnose cancer, uh, use a form of sugar to see where the cancer is sucking it up. I mean, they know that. So why the hell would you put in sugar into the diet, you know? And there's more data than that. You know, there's, there is data where colon cancer and brain cancer that shows the degree of insulin resistance correlates to a worse outcome. Wow. You know, all this is known in the literature. The problem is it's just not taught unless an oncologist dugs out themselves. And, you know, if you read Curable, we're, we're beyond the point where a doctor, a single doctor can practice medicine. Mm. It is far too complex. There is too many studies, too much data. We have to we have to be pit crews. We have to be teams to where they're specialists on each of these branches. And I can envision a future where there's medical oncology, radiation oncology, and metabolic oncology. Mm. And these teams, you know, come up with treatment plans. But yeah, it, it's horribly unfortunate that it's not there. And it's always the patient, you know, it the patient has the to find these things in the road and bring them to the doctor. And if the doctor's resistant, then they typically do it on their own. And sadly, a lot of this is financial because all these things, you know, how do you get paid for a 48 hour fast? Yeah, exactly. um, they don't. And so there's no incentive to do that. And the, there's no incentive for the clinical trials because no one really knows how to make money off of it. So it's, it's, they're stranded in, you know, what we call this financial purgatory. And it's, it's really unfortunate. Yep. Yep. And, and this is why it's so important for people to listen to the episodes like this so they can educate themselves. And it isn't the ideal way for us to be getting, you know, help. And, and, and I mean, especially when you're facing a, a life threatening illness, you want someone to yeah. just tell me what to do. Right. Um, unfortunately, yeah. you, you can't do that. You can't let it, You go. know, Lisa, it, it is changing. We, you know, we, like we just talked about the slow social inertia. So this metabolic therapeutic conference that I go to every year mm. that Dominic D'Agostino yeah. puts on. I've been going to it since the beginning. And the, the first year, I think there was about 80 to 90 people there. Yeah. You know, it's tiny. And this is all based on like ketogenic diets, just metabolic therapies for various diseases. And this last year, there was 16 or last like two, two or three weeks ago, I was just there in, in California. There was 1600 people. Wow. Clinicians from all over. Um, there's a there's a guy from Jethro who from Cedar Cyanide, you know, of impeccable reputation. Um, doing that gave the data on a phase one data on a clinic on a ketogenic diet for glioblastoma. It was compelling enough that they're doing a phase two trial. And my foundation is um, helping out with that trial. So it'll be a huge multi-centered, the largest study ever done on ketogenic diet therapy Amazing. for for brain cancer. So it's changing. It is, it is changing. We, yeah, so it, it wouldn't it. surprise me, you know, if you do run into a clinician that is up in the literature that endorses these things, but you know, not all of them will. No, what I'm finding is that the functional medicine community are very yeah. much up on this and that, but they're general practitioners generally, right? And they're not necessarily your oncologists. And then you get, um, a, a, you know, a couple of integrative oncologists who are starting to bring this into play, but they usually have to step outside the system in order to practice, which means that you have to pay privately for them, right? Because they are not allowed to practice with and bring these things into their practice. Like an oncologist can't tell you about diet because they're not a nutritionist. They can't right. step outside the standard of care uh, because their ass will be on the line basically. And, and people just need to understand. I understand the, the, that, that they have limitations and that they have rules and stuff. But as the patient or as a loved one of the patient, you need to understand that that is the, 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 the situation and that's how the, the, these different rules at play so you can't just go in and hand over all your power and expect that you're going to get the best in the world information because you're not you're going to get the information that that person's been taught for starters you're going to get the information that's allowed by that institution and you're going to have you know hundreds of years of med medical system inertia basically yeah. like you said so beautifully uh, and behind stopping you getting it. I mean, I'm um, dealing with a, a patient at the moment whose mum, uh, a client whose his mum has COVID and we're trying to get the doctors to consider and she's in a rest home, um, ivermectin, you know, and there's 64 trials that are, you know, extremely good evidence and she's 88 and has comorbidities and stuff, but they won't look at it. It's not a licensed medicine in New Zealand. Well, that's wrong for starters because it is, <laughs> but that's their, that's the take of the rest time and that's what they're sticking to. 
And I mean, I lost my, my dad 18 months ago. Um, he developed sepsis after an aortic aneurysm um, blew out in his main aorta and he had a massive operation, survived that. Uh, but I was uh, aware of all the research around intravenous vitamin C and sepsis and Dr. Merrick's work and many of the others, Dr. Mary Fowler and so on. And, and I was desperate to get him intravenous vitamin C. Now, they had run out of options. He was dying and they would not let me do it. And I fought for 15 days against the ethics committee, um, against every, I had to get every staff member's approval in the entire ICU unit, all the doctors, all the nurses, if one spoke against me, I was out. It took me 15 days to fight through all of this while I'm trying to fight for my dad's life, right? To be able to do something as simple as giving him intravenous vitamin C when they yeah. have no other options. And I yeah, lost my dad, you know, it was just- Yeah, that, that's tragic. And you know, the, the end of the light when it's, all of medicine is ri risk reward, right? And you can understand a risky intervention on somebody that's mildly ill, but when somebody's at death's door yeah. and you're talking about something like IV vitamin C, you know, some of our states in the US, we have the right to try law where doctors are absolved of liability and, and the patients are more or less given the right to try wow. end of life, um, you know, Any, interventions yeah. that may or may not save them, but it's, it's the right to try. And I, I wholeheartedly believe in that, that especially with something that, is benign as something like, you know, IV vitamin C, they should, should have the right to try. And, and this was, I like, yeah. I came with the clinical research. They said, we're not interested in the clinical research. It's a legal issue, you know? Um, and and, and we, I found a legal loophole eventually. And my, my, um, my GP who dad had been under was allowed to come into the hospital and administer it under her license and come in and do it. And she would, um, but they only let me do it once. And then they stopped me doing it the second. And of course you need it every six hours. Uh, yeah. and, and by then he was at their doorstep and it did actually turn around all the markers initially, but I couldn't get the second one in in time. They, they stopped me and it took me 18 hours. And I mean, I fought with everything, everything I had. Um, and, yeah. and, and, and I lost that battle. And so vitamin C for me is, is a big part of what I, you know, um, and trying to get that research out there. And now, <laughs> now this cancer journey, it's just like, keep getting slapped it's, around the face, but, um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm slightly, I, I can't stand loss of control. I, I have a hard time yeah. flying and to be locked in the medical system, that profound loss of control is, is absolutely horrific. Me too. And you know, you, <laughs> you what drove me crazy with COVID was you had these monoclonal antibodies that were extremely worked well, right. And, and very few side effects they would not prescribe them for, they'd only give them to people that were high risk. Mm. Now you have this, you know, this phenomenon of long COVID and people that were marathon runners that got COVID and, and are still suffering years later. Why wouldn't they change that indication to prevent, it, uh, prevent long COVID? It was never an option, unless you had money. You notice that all the people that are, are connected or rich, they got the monoclonal antibodies instantaneously, whereas... Wow. If any one of us would have walked in, well, you're not high risk, go home. And that, that drives me crazy that we yeah. don't, in Canada, I was in Canada for um, a few weeks during COVID and they were doing that up there. They were, they were starting to do the monoclonals for just kind of anybody just to prevent long COVID because they, they understood the implications, but yeah, we just never, I just, when you look at the system, you, you, it'll drive you crazy. You don't, the logic is, is, is it just rarely there. operates logically. And yeah. especially in this COVID world, it's like even like all logic has gone out the door. <laughs> but I don't think we'll open up yeah. that monster because that's, that's huge. But yeah, yeah, the monoclonal antibodies and intravenous vitamin C for COVID and, and, and hyperbaric and things like that are not being explored to the extent that they need to be explored. And, you know, this is just, that's another tragedy that's happening and, and people are dying. They're frightened centre when we could have saved them in early intervention early intervention you know like just doing something earlier instead of waiting until their oxygen levels are so low and they're already in dire straits you know instead yes. of just giving them a panadol and telling them to you know sit at home and wait and see whether they start dying or not um right yeah it's, it's for me it's just but let's get back to the the cancer topic because i wanted to talk a little bit like i, I listened to your interview with dr jason fong who's who i really want to get on the podcast too if you can <laughs> give me an intro uh, incredible man. He written the cancer code, um, and, and you, you, you were talking in there about the Abscopal effect, um, which I 
when I was looking with mum in, in lymphoma and we were looking at radiation, we didn't actually have to go down that path yet or touch wood. Um, and I was trying to explain the abscopal effect and the, 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 the uh, protocol that I was after. And I just like, they just looked at me as if I would come off another planet. They didn't know what the abscopal effect was. Uh, one of them did and said, oh, that's rubbish. Um, you know, like, it's just like, uh, you know, like why? So the abscopal effect, just for people who are listening, you may have to, you know, go through radiation or whatever for their cancers. What is that and how does that work? Because that's really interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. So, you know, immunotherapy has got a long history and it goes way back. Um, it goes, it really, it goes way back. When you look in the literature, there was all these document ca documented cases of people before sterile surgical technique where they would get this horrible sort of post-surgery infection and then their cancer would go into remission afterwards. And they had no explanation for that other than the immune system was, was highly activated and it somehow finally noticed the cancer and, and attacked the cancer. That was the most logical explanation. And so that sort of, they sort of, you know, kind of dismissed that immunotherapies then went way by the wayside. And now with this resurgence of, of checkpoint inhibitors and immunotherapies, the abscopal effect has come back. And what, what the abscopal effect is, is occasionally when you, when you target even a single tumor site, even if somebody has metastatic cancer, multiple tumors, you can target a single tumor site and the immune system, it, it roughs up the cell and exposes antigens to where the immune system can finally notice it and lock on and then get activated and attack the cancer. And so there's a, these, you know, documented things during rate, abscopal effects during radiation throughout, throughout the years. But then when immunotherapies came along, those number of those abscopal effects documented sort of skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. And there was, there's a few clinical trials that have been done. One is on breast cancer where they give a much lower dose of radiation while concurrently somebody's on a checkpoint inhibitor and they'll only target one tumor site and they'll hit it with this low dose of radiation while on the check, the immunotherapy, and it'll activate the immune system to attack the, the cancer systemically. And they showed a much longer, much longer survival in, in early stage breast cancer doing this in the small, small clinical trial. But you're right. It's not one of these things that um, I think there are some clinical trials that are proposed to continue to study this, but it's one of those things that's kind of, you know, there's very little risk and why, why yeah. wouldn't you try that? If it's, and, um, this, if you were is, getting full radiation, why wouldn't you just try the, the single tumor site? And this right? is sort of, um, aimed at like, so when the, when the cell, uh, is destroyed by the radiation for the want of a better description, uh, it sort of uncovers the cancer cell so that the immune right. system then recognizes it and goes, oh, I've seen that over there in the liver. Oh, we better go over there and, and uh, attack that as well. Because before they didn't mm -hmm. have an explanation as to why this was happening, but they were just yeah. noticing that this was so that the immune system was suddenly able to, and this is also why as we get older, we get more cancers because the immune system is deteriorating and not doing its job you know, well, and on that front, I'd like to ask your, your opinion, I, I put you on the spot perhaps, but <laughs> if you, you might not know, but peptide therapy, um, what's your take on things like thymosin alpha one, um, IGD 25 and things like that for, especially thymosin alpha one seems to be very interesting to reboot our immune system. Um, I've got my mum on that. Um, that was a mission getting that into New Zealand. I can tell you big fights with meds yeah. trying to get that in, but what's your take on that? You know, I think, Lisa, we're just at the forefront of immunotherapy and, and the immune system is absolutely incredibly complex, right? And, and the way Siddharth Mukherjee described it is there's an ice fall you're climbing and we just got the first pickaxe in and now we can kind of pull up and look and see how far we can go. So, so it's incredibly exciting, immunotherapies. It's, it's, it's really difficult because the immune system has got two jobs and they're two extraordinarily diff difficult jobs to survey for cancer and try to, to get rid of it early. And also it's can, uh, designed to all these checkpoints to not attack ourselves, which if it does, that leads to autoimmunity. So it's got this incredible sort of engineering tension between it where it doesn't want to attack self. And that's why cancer is so good at evading you know, it's got this immuno evasion quality because it is a self cell and the, the immune system, you know, is trained not to nice. attack. So 
So right, that that the, essentially when you when you target with radiation, you could potentially expose some of the proteins that are not look a little different than self, and that's why the immune system can finally lock on. But peptides, you know, tweaking the immune system, turning the dials a little this way and that, I think we'll only get better at it. But it's going to be a it's just going to be a trial and error, long long journey. Yeah, it is. And it's exciting stuff that's coming down the, the line. I heard in that interview with Dr. Fung as well, um, that you would, he was talking about like the early detection of, of cancer. And I know that you're a part of Avert and Zero Life Sciences, um, which I want to get into. Um, and he was talking about, uh, so we've got uh, metastases is an early stage event not a late stage event, like we've sort of pictured it as like you have a tumor growing and then a piece of it will break off and then it will go around the, the, the system and it will lodge somewhere else and it will start growing. Whereas uh, Dr. Dr. Fung was saying, actually, we the, those pieces breaking off all the time and it very from a very early, but it, most of them get killed off in the bloodstream because it's a very you know foreign environment for that cell. Um, and it doesn't make it. But when it does go right around and comes back down to the tumour where it started from, it's now had a selection pressure where it's actually gotten stronger and so you've made a stronger cancer cell. And then and this, and this how that sort of related then to the, the um, heter, um, uh, heterogeneity of tumours, like that they have different genetic mutations in different parts of the tumor and it's like how can that be if it's a somatic mutation theory there should be three or four genes we should be able to target it and the whole tumor should disappear right but actually different parts of the tumor have different genetic mutations and his explanation for that was that it was coming around and it was resettling back down on the on the tumor and but but had different selection pressures going on so it was evolving over time and getting stronger is that did i butcher that <laughs> not at all no that, that's that's correct and, and you know the sort of the the competing theories on that the, the somatic mutation theory contends that cancer is caused by a series of sequential mutations right that leads to the the clonal cell, cell theory where this one cell gains this ability to be a cancer cell and then you get subclonal populations that could have additional mutations. So when you sample a tumor site, you will find uh, cells with different mutations and presumably they all have that founding set of one, two or three driver mutations that kick precipitated the disease. And you can sample metastatic sites and find even different mutational profile, additional to, uh, mutations. So it's the heterogeneity is incredibly large, much more than people thought before the Cancer Genome Atlas project. Mm. And it's, it creates this game of whack-a-mole for this idea of targeted therapy, right? You could target one mutation, but a cell's got a, a mutation in that same system uh, pathway somewhere further down the line that would render that drug ineffectual. And that's the problem with that paradigm of targeted mutations. But the other theory is that these mutations are more of a side effect from the prime cause of the disease, which is in my mind would best be described as a metabolic epigenetic disease. Yep. When you look at, when you look at what a cancer cell is, they, all types of cancer have the same hallmark features. They're all burning sugar. They do this metabolic shift. They're all immortal. They don't die. They evade the immune system. So there's all these pre, these very d defined definitions of what cancer is doing. How can that be from a series of random mutations? And we know these mutations are random. When you sample, for example, 100 women with breast cancer, you know, 10 of them will have this mutation. Some of them will have one mutation completely somewhere else. So it's, there's, very, there's, there's no some consistency, the but there's even cases of cancer with no driving mutations, but it is a histologically identical, you know, definitely neoplastic cancer cell. Mm. So, to, you know, if, if a you told a physicist that, I think they just laugh and they do laugh. Paul Davies was recruited into the cancer, in the cancer program by um, Anna Barker. And he looked at the somatic mutation theory and just thought it was ridiculous the, the, the re, you know, that it <laughs> stuck around this long was, was crazy. So, so if we look at the cancer then as the prime drivers being metabolic and epigenetic, that means that all of those things potentially could be modifiable right? We don't have to target mutations. We can look for ways to change the, the way cells are expressing genes and so forth and metabolizing substrates and things like that. 
Um, and there's all kinds of ways to do that. Like, for example, ketones are what's called HDAC inhibitors. So they do change genetic expression. Um, so th that, I think that is the future of, of cancer therapy. And, the, and the, there's beginning to be epigenetic targeted drugs now, but it's just getting started, you know, and you, we all know how long this takes to get meaningful therapies through the clinic. Yeah, 30, 50 years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and this, is, yeah. And this is science. You know, we, we yeah. tend to think we're in this modern era, but, you know, with regard to cancer, we are really, we'll look back 200 years from now and realize that we were just in the dark ages. Yeah. yeah. We're still using radiation, which was invented about 110 years ago. Yeah. Chemotherapy was invented around World War II. And that's still some, you know, the mainstays of cancer treatment. So, when you look at the other advances in computers and technology, it's just the most slow moving. It's just lagging so far behind. Yeah. And, and then, you know, even when the research is done and there's compelling evidence, it still takes another 30 years to get into the actual clinic on the ground. Yeah. And this is this is where someone like in my situation and many of the people that I'm working with situation is that, OK, we haven't got all the clinical studies in. Uh, we're facing, you know, um, end of life situations. We're going to have to make calls ourselves, and and we have to do the best with what we have. And this is why gathering this information and sharing this information so that people can make the very best decision that they can make. And it's not always going to be right. And I, you know, I was talking to my mum about this yesterday and how much it, you know, weighs on me um, being responsible for the decisions that I make for her health. And yeah. in, in my case, I, I the way I looked at it was I went and got like uh, 14 of the world's best doctors on this. And, you know, I sold a, a house, spent a lot of that money on having these doctors' opinions and protocols and things developed for her. And then I act like the CEO and I make the decisions what we actually put in the mix, you know. Wow. Yeah. Not everybody mm -hmm. has that uh, ability to, to do that. Um, you know, financially, you know, it's, it's, it's been very draining on our entire family, um, but whatever, like for me, it's like, whatever, I I'll, I'll don't care if I lose everything in, in the pursuit of saving a loved one is for me a good exchange of, <laughs> you know, if that's what it takes, but also yeah. um, having the, the mental ability to research and, and to do all of this and, you know, people who are actually sick, how the hell are they going to do that, you know, and if they haven't got a driving person behind them who's who's able to do that they're, they're sort of left you know uh struggling you know to to find this information and it still weighs on me heavily because if i make the wrong decision you know yeah. she will pay the price you know, and, and you, you you shouldn't put a tremendous amount of pressure on yourself because medicine is practiced under a cloud of uncertain uncertainty every day and you can go from one example to the next for that. Say you come in, someone comes in with, with primary uh, diagnosis of primary prostate cancer. There's five treatment options. There's surgery, there's watch and wait, do nothing. And then there's three different forms of radiation. Those five treatment modalities um, have never been compared head to head. We do not know which one's better than the other. Wow. So watch and wait may be the best option, which is doing nothing, but that's terribly you know, when you say the word cancer, that's, that's terrifying. And, and then the, you know, the proton beam, the most advanced, most expensive sort of therapy in that five is what's getting prescribed the most, but nobody knows if that's the best still. Wow. So every day doctors are, are you know, and, and when you do those head to head clinical trials, you find out that decades of, of what was thought was the best treatment paradigm is not, you know, if you look at the, for example, the radical mastectomy, that went on for 80 years before they finally did the trial saying a simple lucky is just as good. Yep. So women were disfigured literally for, for 80 years. And so back it's, it's uncertain. All we can know is what data we have. And then you measure that through a risk reward lens. Mm. So for example, fasting before chemo, that's low very risk. safe. We know that yeah. it's free. So some, something like that with low risk, but could have a potential reward. That's to me, you know, seems like an easy decision. Some repurposed drugs that show very good improved survival outcomes when people are on them that are low risk. We know the side effect profile and it's very mild. That seems like an easy decision. So, you know, you, you just, all we have is the data we have, and then you, you look at the risk reward and, and make those decisions. Yeah. But I think, yeah. I, you know, I, I bravo for what you're doing. It's, it's, 
it's the right way to approach it. I wish, you know, the whole medical system would approach it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing you, you have to do it because you, you don't have, uh, you, you, you can't rely. And this is the thing, you know, this is not against the individual doctors or anything like that, but the system is broken and they're really good doctors and they're really overwhelmed doctors who are trying to, I mean, if you've got 500 patients and you've got two minutes, basically 15 minutes with each one, how the hell are you going to get to anywhere? Right. You know? Right. And I make the point all the time. It's not, we're, this is not against the doctors. This is just yeah. a system, right? This is this, a systemic problem. Yeah. 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 And we got it. We, yeah. And this is why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I, I wanted to, to just, um, go into the soil analysis um can you talk a bit about that one because that was good and i don't want to butcher it so we're, we're looking at a uh, basically a, an analogy of an of a plant being in the right uh, soil can you share that story with us yeah you know yeah, what that's, i mean a lot of, that's i think jason fung kind of that's his yeah line is the yeah. soil hypothesis is where that's the one the way cancer develops is um the soil, right, the, the systemic sort of microenvironment around our cells is just as important as whatever molecular events precipitate cancer. And, and that, that microenvironment is, is, could be causing those molecular events. So that's kind of the seed soil hypothesis. And what it takes, what we know when you look at the evidence is it takes sort of a subclinical chronic, sub chronic irritant over time to, where a cancer cell or a cell starts to take on this phenotype of a cancer cell. And it happens over, you know, over decades. Mm. And so, you know, a virus can do that, a, a sort of subclinical infection that lingers um, damage, obviously from smoking, you know, that that's a physical and chemical damage. It just happens daily. So you get this, this, this changes the entire sort of microenvironment around cells to where it's highly inflammatory. And that begins to change the way the genes that are being expressed in the cell. And it begins to revert back to the genes, the very early genes that we express during uh, embryology. And it, this goes back to, you know, this evolutionary idea of what cancer yeah. is. And when you think about our tenure on the planet, life began about 3 billion years ago. Mm -hmm. And it began as single cellular organisms. And their biological imperative is just to divide, 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 replicative immortality, right? And then somewhere along the line, these cells started living together in a group. And that's when mitochondria, the mitochondria allowed for that. Mm -hmm. And then multicellular life took off. And that was a very special event. We don't know how the probability of that ever happening again. We know it happened once on planet Earth. So wow. it's pretty special that we're even here. But when cells begin to live together, they have to sign a contract with each other not to stop dividing and behave for the benefit of the collective. So what happens, the cancer cell will start to re-express these very, very early genes, our earliest genes in our DNA that go back to this time of unicellularity. And so they, again, they adopt this biological imperative of replicative immortality. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's funny the way life builds on itself. We don't ever reinvent things. We always build off what evolution gave us before. And so those are the genes that are expressed early on in embryogenesis is when an egg is fertilized, there's, you know, begins to build an organism. And then once that organism is built, then those cells just play a specific role to do their job within their organ. But, but cancer cells begin to go back and re-express those embryonic genes. And when you look at an early embryo, the cells look like cancer cells. They're mm -hmm. extraordinarily glycolytic. They're evading the immune system. They're dividing like crazy. Um, so it, it's a really a recapitulation of a biological programs that we already have within us. And how do you tell genes to behave, you know, within the collective? One of the things is, is oxygen. That's an extraordinarily powerful signal to cells to be in the collective. The other is avoid um, any sort of chronic irritants over time, you know, don't smoke and, and things like that. And then, and then just mind the, the microenvironment of your body, which is giving it the right food, exercising. It's designed to do that. Every time you do that, it brings down those inflammatory processes and so forth. So the soil in, in his model is just as important as, you know, the seed of cancer. Whereas before we always focused on the seed, what, what is going wrong in that one cell to cause it to turn into cancer? And, and we didn't really focus on, on the soil. That is just such a beautiful analogy and it sums up basically the approach, you know, so nicely 
Um, and that's why I'd love to get jo Dr. Jason on too, because I think, yeah, there's these sorts of insights. And he's a nephrologist, for those who don't know who we're talking about, and he's the author of The, the Cancer Code, um, another fantastic book. Um, Travis, you've been absolutely amazing today. I could honestly talk to you for hours and I'd love to go into the nitty gritties of uh, the stuff that, that um, you know, are all around the ketones and, and all of that sort of thing. But is there anything that you think we haven't covered off in this conversation that would be really beneficial or anything that you're writing and studying about at the moment that you want to get across that we haven't sort of talked about yet? I think we covered a lot. You know, I... I, like I said, I, I, I'm just, I've always been ex extremely fascinated about that, this hybrid metabolism, this idea of ketones and what they do. And, and the overarching question to me is, what is the natural state of mankind, mm -hmm. right? Because like we said, most people will probably never enter ketosis in their lifetime. Mm. And, and what is the natural state of mankind? How are we, what is our metabolism supposed to look like? And, you know, when we talk about everything from depression to just people feeling good. How are we supposed to feel? You know, what, how good are we supposed to feel? And one of the things you notice with people when they do, you don't even have to go on a full ketogenic diet, but when you, when you reduce carbohydrates or do eating windows, you know, don't eat for 16, 18 hours all the time or a few days a week, they notice a clarity. They, they notice things lifting in their mind. Right. And so, yeah, I, th that to me is fascinating is what, what is our optimal state of being and how are, you know, how are we supposed to live? So that's still a question that, that I think, you know, we don't have the perfect answer to, but we certainly know the, the therapeutic potential of these things we're talking about ketosis and fasting is, is profound. Yeah. And autophagy yeah. and getting rid of senescent cells and, uh, you know, all of that yeah. sort of stuff. And there the was senescent um, cell, the senescent yeah. cell thing is, is another thing that is absolutely astonishing that the data coming out of Mayo Clinic Right, right. So, and people, what happens is, is as we age, some of our cells sort of just stop metabolizing and idle in this pro-inflammatory state, and they don't die, and they cause inflammation. And so um, they gave, they did an artificial intelligence simulation of molecules that would bind to this apoptotic pathway that would kill senescent cells. And they found one, the optimal one was something called fisetin, which is in strawberries. Yeah. You can buy it as a supplement. And they gave it to these mice and then autopsied them. And senescent cells in every tissue were dramatically reduced. Their lifespans were prolonged. And to me, that's the biggest arbitrary, you know, that, that is, it's hard to extend lifespan in mice. Um, and we, you know, we don't know about humans, it's probably harder, but you can extend lifespan by giving them this fisetin. And every marker of health went up. And it was a quick, what they called a hit and run dose. So they just give a big dose for a couple of days and that's it. Wow. So the, to me, that, that's got incredible. If you could give somebody an extract from strawberries and pop these little <laughs> senescent cells. Yep. I mean, know, we were on quercetin. And, and quercetin yeah. is another one of those interesting things. And there's other lots of other yeah. senolytics that uh, are showing promise and things like rapamycin as well um that is showing promise and uh i mean quercetin is definitely part of um you know my protocol daily and mum's yeah. protocol uh i just did a podcast on quercetin actually yesterday so <laughs> and fisetin yeah. is also and, and it's just like, a few atoms different from fisetin they're they're very yeah. they're the same sort of polyphenol um, yep. very close to each other yeah. yeah yeah and then there's interesting stuff around resveratrol and of course nicotinamide mononucleotide enamine um that dr yeah. david sinclair talks about uh spermidine is another one that i'm fascinated by and its ability to uh, upregulate autophagy uh as well i don't know if you've looked into spermidine but that's another really fascinating terrible name not good for marketing yeah. but um fantastic uh, molecule uh, resveratrol is also an interesting one. And there's just all of these amazing co uh, compounds, EGCG, you know, lots and lots that we could go in. And But there's a lot of their group that are senolytics that can help you get rid of these senescent cells. And these senescent cells are just absolutely crucial. These are like zombie cells that go around in your body, weigh them down and cause all this inflammation. So getting rid of that, again, fasting is, a, is, is another way to do it. Um, but adding in these analytics can help as well. Um, just before we wind up, I did want to go to Avert Sciences uh, to your Avert because um, you're a part of that company, aren't you? Avert Zero yeah, Life. Yeah, so uh, yeah, at Stage Zero Life Sciences, we we're one. rolling you. out a program called Avert, which is everything we we're talking about. It's it's preventative healthcare the way we we think it should be done, and you know, 
what we think the science says it should be done. So we do a very extensive panel of laboratory work that GPs normally don't go so deep. So we look at markers of inflammation, markers of insulin resistance, and then the doctor meets with the patient on a tele telehealth consult. So it's very easy, goes through the lab work, what it means, and then potential lifestyle interventions that will change those markers. And then we test, you know, typically every quarter to see if the trend is moving in the right direction from these lifestyle interventions, from everything to sleep, to stress, to exercise, and obviously diet. And then if, if they're too high, you know, these are licensed physicians, we have options of um, very, very low risk drugs like metformin if insulin resistance is high. So I think it's just a fantastic preventative medicine program, the way that it should be done. And it's looking at look um, sort of early stage uh, detection of, of cancer as well too, isn't it? With the, the yeah, we have biopsies. A, right, we have, a, we have a blood biopsy that we're one of the companies that's developing blood biopsies like Illumina, they have Grail, there's quite a few companies and we're in that space looking at, it's a simple blood draw and we try to, the, the goal is to detect cancer as early as possible when it's the most curable when hopefully it's, it's just sim simple surgery can be curative. Wow. Yeah. Is this available internationally or at the moment, is it only available in the States? Because a lot of my listeners obviously- This is available. Well, we, have, we have two places where it's available right now, Richmond, Virginia and um, Toronto, Canada, but we're working on getting labs set up. So it'll be, you know, hopefully available everywhere. So we'll be able to but do the avert, in the next year or two. Yeah. The AVERT program is available um, in all 50 States. It, Anybody yeah. can sign up for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That this is this is just this is where it's at, you know. So let me know when you get international with all of that because, um, you know, I want to yeah. do it. You know, I want to go and get my blood tested and just see exactly where where I'm at. And having the access to that sort of information is for me just absolutely gold for people who are wanting yeah. to, you know, live to 150 and beyond. And I don't think that's ridiculous anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that's our goal. Travis Christopherson, you've been absolutely uh, amazing today. I'm so grateful for your research, um, the passion that you bring to the whole space and, and the work that you're doing. Uh, it is saving lives. So please don't stop. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for your, doing your part, spreading the information out. That's wonderful. Is it, well, where can people find you, actually, Travis, if they want to reach out to you or to any one of your, um, your foundation, your, your projects that you're doing, Avert Sciences? Where, give us some URLs and stuff. Yeah, yeah the, the, the um, Stage Zero Life Sciences, we have a, a, the website's Avert Now. Um, and for me, my, my foundation is the Foundation for Metabolic Cancer Therapies. You can go on the website and see our projects and you can donate on there. And, uh, you know, the goal of that is to, to fund these, sort of like we talked about, these therapies that are in financial purgatory, that there's, they're off patent and there's no way, there's no final financial incentive to, to study them like ketogenic diets and cancer and things like that. And we've had, you know, I had modest expectations, but we've had incredibly generous donors and we've been able to fund a lot of important amazing. studies. Absolutely yeah. amazing. That is really, really exciting because we need someone to take these drugs and molecules and things further and test uh, and get it out there. Travis, thanks for your time today. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Take care. Great talking to you.